I'm Marianne Sasaki. You're watching um, Life in the Law on Think Tech Hawaii. It's been so long. Boom. So uh, we're delighted today to have uh, our guest, Dr. Amy Peruso. Hi. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Um, I, I've uh, we, we, I would love to call a doctor throughout the show, but I'm not going to torment you in that <laughs> Thank way. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, and you're the head of the HSTA, right? I am not the president, so I am the HSTA secretary treasurer. Okay, so, okay. Mm -hmm. And you're also an educator. I am. I'm a social studies teacher at Nilani High School. Okay, great. And we have some thoughts about public education, don't we? <laughs> we might. <laughs> you know, I'm a product of public education, and, you know, I look, I went to Harvard, I went to Columbia. Public education can be very, a very, very good education if somebody's minding the store, if somebody cares, right? Yes. I think yes. that's sort of the issue, right? Exactly. So I think that, um, well, one of the issues facing public education in Hawaii is um, we are struggling to prepare our students for that kind of future mm -hmm. in, in higher education. Um, and now we have an entirely different new national context that might make that even more challenging. How so? Uh, well, our, our situation here is that um, we have the highest rate of private school um, education in the nation. Oh, really? That's too bad, yeah. actually. Yeah. So I'm, it I'm does, surprised. yeah, it does tend to weaken our public school mm -hmm. system, um, and our public school system is underfunded. So um, when we have now a new Secretary of Education at the federal level, um, the attacks that are going to be coming from the federal level are going to be coming towards a, a weakened system. So we already have a fairly weak public education right. system, I would say, in, in terms of the statewide system. Uh, and, and so we need to really pay attention to how to strengthen it right. um, in this time of crisis. I see it as a time of crisis for us. You know, it, it, it takes some parents' commitment to not, you know, to say, I'm not going to send my kid to private school. I'm going to send my kid to public school and then demand the best of the public school. I mean, in New York, there are definitely some public schools. Well, there were, it's, they're generally, you know, not, not the greatest, not as good as private schools, but there were several, mm -hmm. a handful, in neighborhoods where people have obviously money and education. And the parents, you know, demand excellence in education. And I think part of it is educating the parents about what you can, should expect from your child's education. Right. right. I think one, one way that it's, um, there's a really important difference between what happens on the continent and what happens here in terms of funding of public education is that we have the only state in the country that doesn't use property taxes for public education. So that has a positive consequence and a negative but consequence. A negative, right? right? So the positive one is that it's fairly equitable. Right. So, we fund our schools equally across the state. Right. You don't have these rich schools right next to very um, poor schools. Right. But we also have um, the negative consequence is that we're all equally underfunded, right? Because <laughs> right? Right. there's not a lot of um, just support for public school system because so many children are, are attending, uh, so many children, I would say, of the social elite are attending private schools. I know. It, I found it shocking when I came here. I, I found the hierarchy shocking and and I went to Ivy League schools and for me to be like wow this place is really hierarchical and you, you it's who you know and where you go and I'm like wow I it, it, we just really found it stunning right. you know because I'm like the children of the working class you know <laughs> and I'm like what about all these other kids you know but I think that actually our structure gives us an, a remarkable opportunity so if if we can figure out how to decentralize power to move more authority and decision-making power to the school levels um, and if we can figure out that funding question so that we can increase funding to all of our schools, we will be the only state in the country that is able to address that question in an equitable way. Right. So we will be able to have, um, be able to provide really good public education to all of our students who attend public education. And that's part of the purpose of our constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you and I have talked about that before. But we haven't, but I look at okay. it now. <laughs> okay, so uh, essentially we, for the past, well, more than two years, we've been working um, to develop a mechanism for funding the public schools that would really get at some of the problems that we've seen. So we initiated our um, tenure in leadership by going out to teachers and asking them to develop a vision for public education. Oh, and great. we call that um, the schools are cakey deserve. So 
Um, if you go online at HSTA, you can kind of see an elaboration and articulation of that vision. But we recognize that to realize that vision, we needed to fund the public schools in a, a much different way and much more sub substantively. Um, so last year, we tried to uh, argue for the GET. We went to the legislature and asked for funding with, by, with an increase in the GET. And that was not supported. I'm, and not, I'm <laughs> sure. You know, it's so funny because when you say we have to find more equitable funding, I'm yeah. like, raise taxes? But nobody ever wants to hear right. that. But that's what you really, right. what do you, what, what's important to you? But Right. I mean, it is about priorities. But um, we did some polling. So after our setbacks with respect to GET, um, the GET, we actually didn't really want to push because it has regressive implications, right? So it has a, it takes most money away from lower income folks. So mm -hmm. um, yes, it, yes, right, right. So that was a problem for us. We didn't want to do that. You don't want to tax, right? Yeah, um, Und unduly, unduly. Yeah, and so the only other mechanism that will would be adequate to really do what we need to do in public education is property tax. So our constitutional amendment, which if it gets on the ballot, will be in front of voters next year would um, provide a property tax surcharge on visitor accommodations and um, non-owner occupied residential properties. So if you have a second home or residence that you rent out right. and it, it meets the threshold so it's worth over, so they haven't established the threshold so it may be $1 million or mm -hmm. maybe $2 million mm -hmm. has that mm -hmm. value, then you would be subject to this surcharge. I think it's a great, t I mean, yeah. the people here can't really complain about it because it's not going to really hit them. Right. It's, it's really on people coming from the outside. And I mean, if, when you explain to somebody that, you know, schools can't be properly funded without, without property, a property tax, and yeah. you, you, you talk about school, you know, places that have good schools and, and why they have good schools. It, it, it seems like an easy sell, but I'm sure it's a very hard sell. Well, we are going from community com to community and we're talking to neighborhood boards. And I think one of the interesting objections is that, um, you know, we should, everybody should pay for public schools. Everybody should pay a property tax. And um, I, I think that's a noble sentiment, and I agree with that. I do think that all I agree too. Energy. But you can always have people who are like, "I don't have kids," you know. I don't. Right. You know. Right. And also, people may say that, but our polling suggests otherwise. I know. Right. So we need a measure that is going to be acceptable for not just for the legislators to put it on the ballot, but then also for citizens to vote right. to amend the Constitution. I don't understand, you know, I don't understand this push toward like zero tax pay. Mm. Like the cost of living in a civilized society is taxes. I mean, you, it, it, this tension, I, I find it uh, just abominable. And, you know, I was <laughs> talking to somebody because we were talking about the new um, uh, Trump tax plan. Mm, right. And I said to somebody, I said, you know it'll benefit us because it will benefit. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I said, you know, that's not good. That's like <laughs> a bad thing. We don't need right. it. You know. Right. So and I don't think actually, like in terms of that taxation plan, I don't think that that zeroes out taxes or the deficit. I think that it just shifts the priorities to weaponry and militarization. Oh, absolutely. Right. So. Right. Oh yeah. I think in our state, and I think that's one space in which we can work in this very, I would say, frightening national climate, we can work at our state. And for public education, um, what has been happening under DeVos and under Trump is, and even under ESSA, so the new um, federal legislation, ESSA, that was passed in December of 2015, devolved power to the states. So the state policymakers, although they haven't taken advantage of that power yet, mm -hmm. have a, lot, a big space of freedom that they can actually do really important work in public education. Uh, and I think they should take advantage of that. Oh, OK. So who, who would that be here? Like that would be so our superintendent, our Department of Education, um, our governor has a huge role to play. And so we know who to put pressure on. <laughs> right, and, and also like his appointees to the Board of Education. They can do a lot in terms of policy making to improve um, teacher practice, our teacher retention. We have a huge teacher shortage crisis, and they have a lot of work that they can do to 
I know. Everybody that? tells me, you know, everybody uh, in New York is like, oh, I, I wish I could work in Hawaii. And I'm like, become <laughs> a teacher. You'll definitely get a job. That's what they need there, you know? But yes. uh, yeah, I mean, yes. it, 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 I think. But, but the, they won't stay because we can't retain teachers. So we started, we ended last school year with 1,600 openings. We still have almost 600 vacancies. Really? So that means around 10,000 students this year will have a long-term sub. They won't have a teacher. The New York is like that in some in some years. Sometimes it they, depends, they just, right? Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's for us, salary it's, related. It's, it's, over time, it's getting worse. Is so it really? It's a pattern, yeah. So it's a it's a long-term crisis that we have been using short-term measures to address. Mm -hmm. So doing mm -hmm. mainland recruiting trips, and then mm -hmm. people will come for two or three years mm -hmm. and discover the pay is not enough. It's not enough. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I know it's not enough. <laughs> no, it's I have the no lowest idea. In the country. When you take cost of living into account, it is the lowest in the country. Yeah, I'm not surprised, yeah. actually. So yeah. we have a huge teacher retention problem. Right, right. Yeah, we... I, Teachers never get, my mother's a teacher, right? Oh. So I'm very attuned to um, teachers not getting enough money. You know, like, the, the, the difference between what I, what, graduating from law school and mm -hmm. her teaching and what she does and the kind of work she does and the amount of work she does, there's, there's no parity in, 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 <laughs> right. in income. But this parity in work, I mean, it's, right. it's, it's ridiculous, and I don't, I don't understand why teachers' salaries aren't viewed well. Well, I think it's a gender issue. I, I honestly think that it's um, one of the caring professions, and it's um, been undervalued for a long time, and women have dominated the, pr the profession. Our um, HSTA is about 80% women, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that the when you look at how different unions are treated at the bargaining table, um, there is some research that should be done in terms of a gender analysis. I, I think you're right. I think, but of course, I see everything through a gender lens. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's like, "Oh, you're so sensitive," I, and I know I'm not. I know I'm right, but <laughs> nobody ever wants to hear it. But well, you know, lawyers for the first time, lawyers are graduating law school. Women lawyers are graduating law school. And yes. I said, to "Somebody, this is going to have a depressive rate on salaries <laughs> because it's going to become a woman's <laughs> enclave." And yeah. you, wait, you should see. be afraid of that. <laughs> I am afraid of that. Believe me, that's I a mean, horrible thing to be afraid of. I know <laughs> it's a horrible thing to know, like yes. to sort of know or even sense. have to know. Yes, you know, it's just yeah. And and uh, teachers, oh god, I, it's such a hard job. What made you decide to pursue this path? Did you? So I um, come from a family of teachers. Oh, okay. actually, so. Um, Everyone on my dad's side of the family and my siblings were all teachers, and, and, but I never intended actually to become a classroom teacher. Uh, I was headed towards academia or law school, and I just found myself, um, when I began teaching, I just fell in love with it. Let's just take a quick <gasps> break on that note. See, all teachers feel this way. <laughs> this is why they don't get paid any money. They love doing it. So I don't love doing the law. I do it, but I, no, I do. I love the law. I can't say that. That's not true. So we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back with Amy Caruso and talk more about public schools under attack. Hey, has your signal just been taken over, or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Carol Mon Lee, and I want to welcome you to our newest series called Education Matters, where we will explore education-related topics that touch everyone, not just formal programs in K-12 and higher education, but also broader issues and information that affect our community. My name is Mark Schlav, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much.
Hi, you're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. I'm here with Amy Peruso uh, talking today about public schools, public school teachers, public schools under attack. And the very last thing that Amy said before we went to break was that she loves it. And while we were on break, she said she loves it and she would do it for free. And I tell you, <laughs> my mother is a teacher and she feels the same way. And so, okay, so you have all these people who that are dedicated to this profession above and beyond. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really uh, um, amazing to behold. So what kind of remuneration uh, could you give them? Okay, so you, may, you can't give them a big salary increase maybe, but what kinds of things can you do to entice people to come and teach? I mean, what kinds of perks? Okay, so I may be willing to um, teach for free, but um, I think that I couldn't sustain my life if I, um, and, and also like it, it's barely sustainable now in terms of salaries for teachers. So I have worked with so many amazing teachers who have had to leave the profession because they can't actually make it. They're working two or three jobs right. Right. and um, it's just, too draining. They can't even teach pr properly. No, yeah, so, uh, definitely. In yeah. New York, there are people that teach, and then um, it, dip, it go, goes on tiers, and also the the, the contracts change from mm -hmm. time to time. So the contracts have been getting less less good, actually. Yes. And they work in Macy's during Christmas time yes. and stuff like that. I mean, yes. these teachers, were, yes. you know, they work. And it's not just at breaks. Like a lot of teachers will leave school and go to their second job. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, f the finances, the salary part, the material conditions for existence are really important. Let's talk brass tax. What does a beginning teacher make in Hawaii? About $45,000. That's not bad. So, That's not bad. Right. But, but it's bad for Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. So here's what we found out in our research when we looked at districts with similar cost of living that our beginning teachers are making about $4,000 less than the average given the, from, with those similar mm -hmm. districts. Um, our teachers who are near retirement, so they've taught like 25 years, they're about seven to $9,000 less than the, what they should be making. So it, 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 no, it, it, but then in the middle is where we see the huge gap. So really? yeah, if you're teaching, if you've been teaching like 10 to 15 years, then you're making about fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars less than you would be making anywhere else with a similar cost of living. That's yeah, not an yeah. inducement to stay. No, Definitely and not. and people, I think it affects morale. So oh. that combined with like the teacher evaluation system, um, the demoralizing impact of salary combined with that system. What's tell are me about the profound. system? I don't know anything about the system. Yeah, so under race to the top, um, our the leadership of the Department of Education and the Board of Education and the governor um, decided to create policy, boarded, board policy, board of education policy that puts into place a teacher evaluation system that is fairly punitive and onerous. So it's really time consuming for teachers and it basically forces you to prove every year that you're a professional. Really? Yeah, and it takes um, an incredible amount of time and it's demoralizing right. because you have to, um, well, there are lots of reasons that it's demoralizing, but um, teachers are very critical of it. And over the entire state, our data, our survey data, suggests that that's what the, one of the, if not the most important factor in teacher, um, uh, I would say, loss of job satisfaction or I, lowered job satisfaction. I understand that because, you know what, my mother loved teaching, yeah. but I don't think she loved it. The, any administrative work. I think any administrative work she viewed as time she could be actually teaching. Right. So it, anything that burdens the teacher and, and makes, I mean, and that's unpaid, right? Yeah. That's, that's unpaid yeah. work. You have yeah. to do that, you know, yeah. before class or during yeah. lunch or whenever, whenever, or at night or whatever, whenever you need to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I can imagine that that, um, that would diminish job satisfaction. It's, listen, it, you know, it, it, even as a lawyer, when I have administrative tasks, I'm like, yeah. I wish I didn't have to do this stuff. And you guys really shouldn't have to. I mean, because you're doing yeah. important work. It just takes away from the time that we can be working with students. Right. Um, and it feels fake and, and manufactured, kind of artificial, right. putting on a show. Right. Um, do we, is it teaching to the tech? Like, do they, how do they, how do they? So there are multiple parts to the teacher evaluation system. 
Um, one of the parts is looking at student learning outcomes over the course of the year, and that part is extremely time consuming and problematic because it's based on how well you predict how well your students will perform at the end of the year, given your preliminary data. So it's not even about like how far did you move them, it's how accurate are your you predictions. Are <laughs> Do you do it with a crystal ball? How do you figure that out? I know, and then that really doesn't account for like children's lives during that right. year. They could, right. their parents could go through a divorce. They could be, you know, the or good things too. I mean, you know, yeah. you can have a f really favorable outcome in right. a kid that you right. didn't anticipate. <laughs> I mean, that's also a problem. That's the fun. <laughs> yeah, that's the fun of yeah. teaching. I think is yes. is the road and the you know it's it's a new path every yes. day. But such a system induces you to under expect, and the research has shown that ha that has negative consequences for the students learning. So if you're expecting less of them so that you can meet your predictive goal, then <laughs> that totally learning makes sense. Less. That totally really <laughs> makes sense. So it's crazy. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna just so we can hit our marks, we're okay. gonna we're gonna we're gonna tell you that you're you know you could only do you're gonna do the X when yes. you could do X plus Y yes, plus Z. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. So you wanna tell us about your uh, big election race? Oh <laughs> okay so um, it's not really a big election race, but I'm running for neighborhood board in part because we want to have teachers um, be part, more part of these public policy making right. discussions sure. and um, part of the democratic process. So um, myself and other teachers are running for neighborhood board. We're talking about running for office. In the fifth district. Yeah. This is really important. <laughs> See, now you're, 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 you know, you think it's, it's, it's only neighborhood board and yeah. you know, whatever. But you know what? It's so critical during this election period. We know, we talk about it all the time when we go to the meetings, the Women's yes. March meetings. It's so critical at this time to sort of start packing the ranks with people that can, you know, do things in in the next election in right. the next in two years you know and yeah and for me actually this is connected to the work that i'm doing with the union as well because what i've seen in my work around the essa task force is that there's a huge chasm between the communities and the public schools because the school community councils are not working um uh, because the community has no power in those conversations anymore mm -hmm. So the communities are not connected to public schools, and I really see the neighborhood boards as a way to reconnect public schools right. and the communities. You know, it's funny the property tax would would actually right. actually help that because right. you because if you start paying for something, all of a sudden you have right. like a sense of pride in it. Even if you, you don't have kids, that, yes. but you know, I have the, be, the this is the best school district. Yes. People want to move into yes. the areas with the best school district. Yeah. So how like so what do you like? How do you, uh, you know, do you go door to door? How, what do you do? <laughs> I, I haven't started going door to door yet, but I think I'm going to have to because, okay. um, because there's a, there's this increased attention to local politics. Um, the races are much more competitive this time, mm -hmm. so I think I am going to go door to door in my community, and I think that that's a good thing. That oh, actually, absolutely, it's it's kind of surprising to me how little um, neighbors know each other right. or how unfamiliar they are with each other. That's surprising to me too, because you know you think New York, you think it's big anonymous city, right? But you know we live in apartment buildings, and each apartment building is like a little tiny ecology, mm. and you know at least. I'd say between five and ten people that you can really count on mm. it. I don't know if you're going away on vacation, whatever, you yeah. know. And but but here, everybody's in their car. It's right. really hard to socialize. I think right. I told you that when I yeah. when we when yeah. we had dinner. It's it's really hard to connect with people. There's no yeah. public spaces yes. really that people connect in, you know. Right. So yeah, you should go door to door. Yeah. And just introduce myself and find out their concerns. Right, right. Um, You'll probably so. be the only one that does it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if 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 I somebody came to my door and asked for my vote and like nobody else did, I would. Yeah. I mean, even you know, I I work for Obama, and they, yeah. basically they said you go door to door and ask yes. for each person's vote. Yeah. Like each person's vote is yeah. you have to individually ask for it, and yeah. that's essentially what they did. You yeah. Know? So, well, so when's the election? Um, so the election time period, so there's a um, uh, mail-in process, so it begins at the end of April and ends in early May. District um, 5, District Amy <laughs> Peruso. <laughs> um, and I think that that is actually really nicely connected to 
the organizing around the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party will have its convention on April 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there are a lot of things happening in the state that kind of lend themselves to folks increasing their participation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important right now. I feel like it's urgent. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. You said this thing about, um, I don't know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, crisis since the election or turmoil since the election. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know a person that doesn't feel it, that doesn't feel disoriented. Yeah. And, you know, the news every day yes. is, doesn't it help, you know, calm you down. Right. It, it sort of stirs things up. It's yeah. just, it's the most, you know, it's it just, it's unbelievable what's going on, you know? Yeah. So I, w I should say that Amy and I met on the Women's March to Washington, which everybody knows my sad story. I didn't get to Washington. <laughs> and well, so what, how are you, uh, you we, last, we, our last meeting we had yes. those uh, little groups and we, mm -hmm. we discussed how we were going forward with our, uh, you know, with, a, with, with, the, with the operation, with yes. the plan. So yes. ha are you, have you done anything? I haven't. I, I have been working around the labor issues. Okay. So um, we are planning uh, an action on May 1st. Okay. So we'll be gathering at the Capitol, and it'll be public and private sector unions gathering at the Capitol and marching to the federal building. Oh, okay. Um, I'll join you there. Okay. I'm a, <laughs> May 1, I always like to celebrate. It really irks right? people. <laughs> So May Day is Lay Day, here. Um, and but it's a it's a Labor Day, and I think that oh. for working women, we yes. should tell why May Day irks people. Oh, I mean, it's because it's because it's um, associated with you know uh, socialist communist values and you know workers' rights and the workers labor movement. Of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Workers of the world unite. So yes. so you know. The, it, the, inter, the international left-wing implications of May yes. Day is... <laughs> Which I think here are very muted, um, but historically the labor movement here has been very important and powerful in oh, it's the most powerful social change. Uh, I'm so impressed by the labor yeah. movement here. It's yeah. really made inroads. Like, I was a corporate lawyer in New York, I'm a corporate lawyer here. When I advise my clients here I, and they want to do something here, I said, I have to advise you, labor costs... Mm. Are, are high here. Right. They really are. Right. Because why? Because people make a decent, they're, they're sort of trying right. at least to have, make sure right. that people make a right. decent living, right? And but we're the most unionized state in the country. Um, but I think that that is part of what I see as a crisis, that um, unionization is part of the um, prosperity and it's part of, like, if you um, pay attention to Robert Reich's uh, arguments about the economic change, um, we are going to see that undermined, I think, under Trump. I think there's going to be an attack on the unions. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but oh, no. the unions, yeah. you know, it started under Reagan with yes. Patco, and it's just yes. this lovely Republican, uh, this is like that hobby, the dismantling <laughs> unions. It's like, I don't know, I don't have anything to do tonight. Let's see what we're, how many <laughs> unions we can take apart. Yeah. But it, I loved having you. Thank you so much My for coming. My pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so great. For having me.